Welcome home. Let's stand together. Members, thank you for your faithfulness. We are glad that you're here at home with us. Amen. If you're visiting with us, we are honored that you chose to worship with us today. Members, make our guests feel welcome in this place today. We hope that you feel right at home with us as we worship our Lord and Savior this morning. Father in heaven, we're grateful for your love for us. We're grateful for the promise that we're two or more gathered. You are there with them. And Father, we invite your presence into this place today as we sing beautiful songs of worship. Father, we pray that it would be a sweet savor to you. That Father, you'd be pleased with our worship. Lord, we invite you to do great things in this place. We surrender ourselves to you and ask you to change lives, heal the broken, restore the sick. Father, I pray that you'd save the lost. And whatever you choose to do in this place, we give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor for what you will do because you alone are worthy of all our praise. Thank you, Jesus, for being here with us today. It's in your name we pray all these things. And the people of God said, amen. Let's worship together.
good God some praise this morning. Yes. Let's sing together. We've waited for this day. We're gathered in your name. open our eyes. We are ready to see him today. Amen. If you're ready to see God this morning, say amen. 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 Thank you so much, as I said at the start of the service, for being here today. We are so honored to be able to live in a country where this is a freedom that we can meet together and worship our great God together. Amen. Amen. Well, if you're glad to be in God's house today, take a minute, go around the room, tell someone you're glad to see him at Liberty Baptist this morning. Yeah. <laughs>
sing about his name.
stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Declare it to him, church, one more time. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 That is who you are, that is who you are. Oh, Jesus, we're so grateful that you are our promise keeper. Not a single promise made in scripture you've ever failed to keep. We can trust your word. You're a way maker, the Bible says, when it seems there's no way. You are the way, the truth and the life. Jesus, we thank you for all the things that you are to us. As we learned in our Sunday school class this morning, Father, you are the word, you are the light, you are Jesus, the Son of God, second person in the Trinity. And as we've just sung, you are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. We're thankful that the God who did miracles in the scripture thousands of years ago is the same God that is in this place right now. We've gathered in this room to worship you today. I pray that those worshiping with us online, I pray that they feel the presence of the Holy Spirit right there where they are. God, that you would unite them with us as we worship you today. We love you so much. And we're so grateful for your love for us. Love that compelled you to go to the cross to offer us the plan of salvation. It's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. You may be seated.
Well, amen. Thank you, Brother Hill. Take your Bibles this morning. Let's turn to the New Testament book of Hebrews. Hebrews this morning. We're going to be in chapter 2. Trust that Sunday school went well. I think Brother Copeland said he had a good class. I know the Transform class and the, or the Crossroads class and the God Squad was good and the children's ministry. We'll, be, we'll, we'll start seeing people drift back in and get back... Uh, back faithful and, and on task. That's my prayer anyway. Amen. Uh, you know, we've been going through this whole thing, just uh, staying faithful to God and uh, trying to bring glory to Him and pleasing to Him. And uh, we've got a lot of folks traveling because of vacation. We do have some folks sick and, and we still have a lot of folks that are still staying at home. And if you're watching online, uh, thank you for joining us this morning. I don't know about you, but I've got a weakness. You know, they say uh, uh, confession's good for the soul. Uh, one of my weaknesses is I like the golden oldies. Uh, you know, I was born in 1965, and uh, yeah, I'm old, right? I'm getting there. Dad turned 75 this week, and I'll be 55 this year. So, uh, but uh, mom and dad, I remember them listening. I still, I can't remember my name half the time, but I can remember listening to those oldies back in the day. And uh, uh, from the, and, and I don't know why, but a lot of the old. Uh, Rock and roll songs from the 50s, 60s, even when I was growing up in the 70s, I remember listening to some of that, and uh, there's a lot of, lot of good, uh, good, just fun-loving music back then, and it wasn't all Christian stuff, but uh, I, I don't know, I just, I, I'm, I'm drawn to that time period for some reason. I was watching uh, that m movie, The Sandlot, this week about baseball, and the boys growing up playing baseball on a sandlot there in the neighborhood, and uh, while I didn't grow up in the 50s, I've always been drawn to that. It just seemed like it was such a great time in American history. You know, World War II was over. Uh, it was really before Korea, and, you know, everybody was just, you know, I don't know, it just seemed like a really good time. And, uh, and I, I suppose I glamorized those times, uh, and, and I, I know when we look back, we always seem to remember things being better than they probably really were. But I love the music from that time period. I also love some of the, uh, you know, the radio shows and the, some of the TV shows. Remember Lucille Ball? Oh, man, it, it, she was a nut. She was just absolutely a nut. But I loved watching her. I grew up watching her. I still remember, uh, it seemed like uh, in my memories, Mom always was ironing something back in the day. You know, we don't iron anymore, but my mom always was ironing. And uh, Lucille Ball would be on uh, TV back then. There was a, there was a group uh, that I particularly like, not necessarily for... The, the, the people's character or anything like that, I honestly don't know a lot about them, uh, but I, I love groups that are very musical. Uh, they can really play instruments to the fullest, and they have the ability uh, to harmonize. And Simon and Garfunkel was one of those duets. I mean, some of their music was just amazing how they could harmonize like that and play the guitar the way that they did. Kind of like the Beach Boys back then. That was a different type of music, but they had the ability to harmonize and sing those high parts and... And, uh, you know, if you haven't been driving down the road and singing Help Me Rhonda, you know, to the top of your lungs and hitting the high parts, uh, you know, you just missed out, right? But Simon and Garfunkel, they, they were very successful and I think still together to this day. But Paul Simon went out on his own eventually and recorded some solo albums. And uh, one of the songs that he wrote uh, went to the top on the billboards. And the song was entitled Slip Sliding Away. And I, I remember that song for some reason. Here's some of the words to it. It says, Well, God only knows. And maybe that's why I remember it, because he addresses God. Well, God only knows. God makes his plan. The information's unavailable to mortal man. 
We're working our jobs, collecting our pay, believing we're gliding down the highway when in fact we're slip sliding away. And the chorus goes slip sliding away, slip sliding away. You know you're near your destination the more you slip sliding away. Now, theologically we understand that's not very accurate, but it brings out a point that I see in a lot of Christians today. And it makes me think of that song. And, and, it, and it's, it's simply this, that so many people have slipped. So many people in our culture have slid away from where they once were in their faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. It reminds me, speaking of songs, it reminds me of another artist. He came along in the 90s and his influence, although he's not around anymore, he joined the 27 Club. If you're not familiar with that, you can Google it later. But he joined the 27 Club when he took his uh, life. His name was Kurt Cobain. He was the one that brought about the grunge, uh, the grunge movement. You remember when everybody started wearing the beanies and the messy hair. It didn't have to be clean anymore. It didn't have to be combed anymore. Uh, shirts and pants, you know, uh, tattered and things like that. Well, he's the one that was very responsible for that in his group Nirvana. He was a multi, multi-millionaire. Many, many records went platinum. He became the most acclaimed and creative singer of his generation, in fact. But his life was far uh, from easy. In fact, it was marked by disaster and difficulty. His parents divorced when he was just eight years old, and his two uncles, who had been very influential in his life, both committed suicide. This was Kurt Cobain. His marriage brought forth a daughter, and you thought it would bring forth stability in his life, and things would be better for him. But three years after the band's fame, at the height of his popularity, with a wife and a daughter, Kurt Cobain in 1994, took a shotgun and killed himself. He left a note behind to his family and his fans, and here's what he revealed in his heart. And I, a couple of weeks ago, I talked to you about some ministers and even Christian music groups that for whatever reason had just got to the place where they left the faith. They denied some even the very existence of God. And I want you to listen to Kurt Cobain because I think his words and how his heart was at that time that he took his life is, is, is probably very fitting for where someone maybe perhaps is in their Christian life. He said, I've not felt the excitement for so many years. I feel guilty beyond words about these things. When we are backstage and the lights go out and the manic roar of the crowd begins, it doesn't affect me anymore. The fact is, I can't fool you, any of you. It simply isn't fair to you or to me. The worst thing I can think of would be to try to trick people by faking it and pretending as if I were having fun when in fact I'm not. I just don't have the passion anymore. So remember... And here's what he said, his last words. It's better to burn out than to fade away. Now, I found no indication in searching out his life that he knew the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a tragedy that is. What a tragic testimony that is for a young man that literally had everything. Everything you can imagine to get to the point where he had no passion, no purpose, and no reason for living. But I think that perfectly represents the, the tragedy of many who are saved this morning. They once had purpose. They once had passion. And yet today they've grown cold. They've grown indifferent towards God. And like Kurt Cobain, they don't feel the passion anymore. Now, maybe that's not you here. Uh, you're the backbone of the church, and we're, we're blessed to have guests this morning. And we thank you for being here. But maybe somebody listened online today, or maybe down the road. You're not here because the passion has faded. You're not here because perhaps you've slipped away. But by divine appointment, God has brought you to listen to this message. And I want to tell you, Andrew Murray once said this. He said, there's two types of Christians, those that burn for God and those that go back on God. And I don't know about you, but I want to be a child of God that burns for God and one that burns brightly for God. The truth of the matter is, if we do not keep ourselves in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, any one of us can go back on God. We started a series in Revelation on Wednesday nights this past week, and we're in the message to the first church at Ephesus. And that was an amazing church. They had done amazing things, and, and the Lord Jesus commended them. But then He said, I've got something against you. You've left your first love. And I think that can describe so many of us at various times in our life, in our walk of faith, 
And maybe it describes somebody here this morning. You've lost the fire. You've lost the fervor. And to use Paul Simon's words again, when you think you're actually gliding down the highway when in fact you're slip sliding away. I've spoken to so many people over the years that that would come to me and say, Pastor, I can't remember a time like this when it seemed so far away from God. I remember being close to God. I remember how that felt. I remember the newness and the freshness after salvation and the passion that I had to serve God. And for the life of me, I can't figure out what the problem is. Somewhere along the way, I tell you folks, they just started doing church for themselves. Somewhere along the way, they just did church for their friends, for a social connection. Somewhere along the way, one's love life with the Lord Jesus Christ faded, and they left their first love. Now, I used to be of the mindset that it was God's uh, job to keep me in love with Him. But I found, as I've studied the Bible, that's not true. It's my responsibility to stay in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. Through that song, we just celebrated our great salvation. We'll talk about that in a few moments. But when I consider what Jesus did for me, that God loved me so much that He sent Jesus to pay the price for my sins, to save my soul, and to rescue me from an eternity in hell. Man, I can't help but love the guy. Amen? And I'm reminded, you know what, that I need to keep myself in love with Him. I prayed this week in a, in a, in a, a, a day that was a little difficult. I wasn't particularly feeling well health-wise, and I had to pray, God, encourage me, but more than that, help me to encourage myself in the Lord. Amen? That's what David did when his, when his, his wife and his kids had been taken at Ziklag, and it said he wept until he could weep no more. You ever been there? The Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. His army, his family, they, wanted, they, they all wanted to kill him. This is your fault, David. The Bible says that when it's just him and God, he encouraged himself in the Lord. And maybe you're here this morning and that's what you need to do. You need to remind yourself of what Jude in verse 21 says, keep yourselves in the love of God. That is to stay on fire. We must continually feed that fire and keep it burning. Amen. No fire stays going eternally unless you continue to stoke that fire and keep that fire going. And that's what we need to do with our fire for Christ. Amen? We don't keep our salvation going, but I tell you, through keeping our service going, the satisfaction and the joy of our salvation comes to us. Amen? I must keep myself in love with Jesus. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, the Christian life is very much like climbing a hill of ice. Now listen to this. You cannot slide up. You have to cut every step with an ice axe. Only with incessant labor and cutting and chipping away can you make progress. If you want to know how to backslide, just stop going forward and upward and you'll go downward by necessity. You can never stand still, the Prince of Preachers said. Amen? Dr. Bob Jones Sr., every time I remind myself of this quote, it convicts me because he said this, if you've ever been closer to God than you are right now, You're backslidden. And just by definition, that makes sense. If I've ever been closer to God than I am at this very moment, I have backslidden away from Him. With that in mind, I want you to look at our text this morning. And I'll tell you, I could focus on all the backsliding that people are doing out in the world. I don't think you have to look very hard on the news media to see the craziness going on in our world. And even for Christians, I've heard some things come out of Christians' mouths this week that just absolutely floored me. I mean, well, I'm just not going to go there this morning. But anyway, but I know this. There's a, there's, a, there's a tendency, if we're not careful, to slip away. We can't stay static and move forward. Amen? We must move forward or we're going backward. And I want you to understand this morning, because every one of us that have ever slipped away from God, we know it. We know it. It's not a surprise. We know what we've done. And our desire this morning ought to be to come back to Christ, to come back to God. So notice Hebrews chapter 2, and let's begin reading in verse number 1. It says this, Therefore, we ought to give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time 
we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him. I want you to notice three things with me this morning. First of all, I find in this passage right here a caution that we must heed. Notice it reminds us, there's, there's, this is the first of five warnings that reminds us that we need to be aware that there are certain dangers in the Christian life. Notice the implication. There's two steps that we must take right here if we're to avoid slipping spiritually. Step number one is simply this. Be receptive to the Word of God. Maybe you're here this morning and, 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 and you can tune out or maybe your mind drifts off to something else that you got to do later today or next week or, or what's going on in the world. Uh, but I tell you, we need to be receptive to the Word of God if it's to work in our lives. And we see that in verse number 1. Therefore, we ought to give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. The idea is one that eagerly awaits and eagerly accepts the Word of God into their life when they read it and when they hear it. Amen? And so that ought to be an an exciting moment for us when we get to come to God's house. David the psalmist said, I was glad to me when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen? Does that describe your relationship? Does that describe your church experience? You know what? I can't wait for Sunday. I can't wait for Sunday. i got to be honest with you. I don't take a lot of vacation. Years ago when I became pastor, I, I... I, the deacon said, you got four weeks vacation a year. I've never taken more than two weeks. And it kills me to even be away those two Sundays. I hate being away from my church. But I guarantee you one thing, if I'm sick and I'm not at church, my whole life, my whole week is out of sync. Why? Because I anticipate meeting with God and meeting with God's people and being encouraged and being uplifted and being challenged by the Word of God. We must hear what God has said. Amen? So we've got to hear it simply. Hear Here, here. My wife tells me all the time, she'll tell me something, and and as God is my witness, I have no recollection of that. She goes, well, you just tuned me out. And I was like, I don't do it intentionally, honestly. I just a lot of times, like Charlie Brown operator, I hear the wah, 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 wah. You know, especially I have the ability in my mind, and my dad had this, and I never knew he had it back when I was a kid, but he had it then, and I've got it now. And that is, he can sit there, and be in a zone watching his TV, and I mean, the house could be burning down around him, and he's just focused, you know? And, uh, you know, I told my wife, I said, listen, if you want me to hear you, come and touch my head or touch my arm. The minute she makes contact, she's got my attention, right? But she can walk into a room and start blah, 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 blah. I don't hear. And so it is with so many Christians. When the Word of God goes forth, Blah, 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 blah. Here's Pastor Rick again. Blah, 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 blah. I've heard him before. Blah, 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 blah. And we don't hear what God has said because God speaks through the Word of God, the man of God, and the Holy Spirit of God. That's how God speaks. You start hearing voices in your head. Listen, I'm telling you, you better stay away from Taco Bell, okay? God speaks through His Word. Forever, O Lord, Thy Word is settled in heaven. God speaks through His Holy Spirit. And amen for that. And hopefully, if you've got a prayed up, prepared, Holy Spirit-filled pastor and preacher of the Word, he speaks through the man of God. Amen. And that's my heart's desire, to never give you my thoughts, my antidotes, but to give you what God's Word says. Amen. So the first step in preventing spiritual slip is what? Well, we've got to hear God's Word. But notice, not only be receptive to the Word of God, but step two involves being responsive to the Word of God. Amen. It's like our kids, we tell them to do something, they hear us. And then we come back later and go, I thought y'all were supposed to take the trash out. I thought you were supposed to turn that off or do this or do that. Uh, I forgot. What did they not do? They they, They were receptive, they heard it, but they didn't respond to it. They weren't responsive. So it is with us, being receptive to the Word of God and responsive to the Word of God. We see it in verse number one. Notice, we ought to give more earnest heed... Heed to the things which we have heard. So what is that? Well, I want to call your attention, first of all, to that word, therefore. And what this is, this is the why. This is the why we ought to give more earnest heed to the things we've heard. What is the book of Hebrews about? The book of Hebrews is about this one thing. 
The theme of it is the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter what you've heard, He's better, amen? In fact, He's the best I've ever seen, amen? And that ought to be a blessing to you and I because we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We follow Him. We have His salvation. He's the best. There's none greater. And so you go to chapter 1. And what does it talk about there? It talks about all the things that have happened and how now we've got Jesus and He's better. He's better. You can read it for yourself later on. That's our connection to chapter 1, the word therefore. Anytime you see the word therefore, you need to see what it's therefore. Amen? That's a good, that's a good way uh, to understand that word. And so we're exhorted what? To hear the word of God, but we're also exhorted to heed the word of God. And here's what he says, give the more earnest heed to the things which you have heard, lest at any time you should let them slip. It doesn't do enough to hear it. If you're not heeding it, it will slip away from you. You know what? One of the examples of the seed that was sown, Jesus said it's the word of God. And what happened? It was ignored and the fowls came and devoured it. You know what the devil wants you to do? He wants, to, wants you to hear the word today. He has no problem with that but he wants you to ignore it so that the devil can come and snatch that away from you and fill your mind with other things, other priorities, and other, other tasks. And so you will not be mindful of the word that you've heard today. Give the more earnest heed. The word heed right there means to attach oneself to. And it carries the idea of grabbing hold of something and adhering to it. Years ago, one of our deacons said, you know, you're a bulldog, Pastor. I was like, a bulldog? Is that because my face looks like a bulldog's face? Or He goes, no. He said, probably more a pit bull. He says, because when you get a grip on something, you never let go of it. I take that as a compliment, amen? When I get a hold of something, I don't want to ever let go, especially if it's of the things of God, the Word of God, amen? I want to stand on that truth. I want to stand on that doctrine and never let go, never equivocate, never let that be watered down or diluted in my life. So what does this mean? It's not just listening to the Word. It's having a love for the Word. It's not receiving it, but it's responding to it. It's simply doing what God's Word tells us to do. Amen, church? Just do what the book says. 99% of our, our problems and, and stuff in life and our attitudes in life and our frustrations in life would be so much better if we would just do what the book says to do. Amen? Amen? And, and how do we know what to do if, we, if we're not ever going to crack the book? If we're not ever going to read the Word? If we're not ever going to take it and apply it to the need of our life? I was thinking this week just what a joy it is and what a great privilege it is to have been raised in a Christian home and taught the Word of God in this church for all these many years. But, and, and you know, to have a seminary degree and all that is great, but the truth of the matter is the majority of my learning and doctoral foundation did not come from seminary. It came right here from Liberty Baptist Church, just hearing the Word and then heeding the Word and seeing people heed the Word and following their example. Amen? It's living our lives according to the book. I, I heard the story of a ski resort in Colorado. That's an, I've water skied, but I've never snow skied. One of these days, well, you know what? That ship's probably sailed. I can't hardly walk these days, let alone get on a ski without breaking something, you know. But they were there and they were skiing and the signs were posted and it said this, danger out of bounds. And yet despite the warnings, a number of people went down that area. It caused an avalanche that killed four people. What were they, what were they doing? The truth of the matter is, we know what God said. We just don't do it. They saw the sign. They just didn't do it. It's the same with these numbskulls out here breaking laws and doing all this stuff. They know what the law is. They know what the rule of law is. That's, by the way, that's the only thing that keeps this thing going we call America is the rule of law. We can't have the law and ignore the law for some others. It's either the law or it's not the law. And the, you know what? I, I was thinking today because I was trying to get to church on time and I was speeding a little bit. And I was thinking, you know what? If, uh, if I get pulled over, what excuse should I use? I hate Trump or uh, uh, BLM, BLM. I mean, and I'm being facetious, but you, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, they're burning and pillaging and beating the tar out of women and elderly people. And, and they just put a brand on it. And if all of a sudden, if you hold up the rule of law, you're racist. You know that word doesn't mean what it, what it 
used to mean, right? If you're a conservative Christian that stands for conservative values and you're pro-life, I'm going to tell you right now, you're a racist according to their definition. Not the definition, but their definition. I have no problem. I don't care what the color of your skin is. I've said it before, red and yellow, black and white. I love all people, especially Mexican folks. They have the best food, amen? <laughs> That's racist, Pastor, to say that. It's true. I mean, when Miss Duke and Miss Dishman joined the church, our, the quality of our Mexican food here, uh, it, it doubled. I mean, it got really, really good all of a sudden, you know? The problem's not that we don't know what to do. The problem is we don't do what we know. Amen? It amazes me how many Christians today ignore the truth of God's Word. And, and, and what they bought into is this cultural change. Well, that was for that time. That was, uh, that was you, you have to understand, Pastor, the culture then, and, and that was for that. No, forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled. Earnestly contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered unto the saints. Timothy preached the word, love, exhort, rebuke with all long suffering, and the doctrine, that was settled. It's not changing. It's not designer truth. We must be receptive and responsive to the word of God, Amen. There's a very powerful quote by a pastor by the name of Clovis G. Chapel. He said this, Whenever you make up your mind to refuse to go where God wants you to go and to do what God wants you to do, you must make up your mind at the same time, now listen to this, to renounce your friendship with God. You cannot walk with Him and at the same time be in rebellion against Him. God has no possible way of entering into fellowship with the soul that is disobedient to His will and His word. Believe me, it is absolutely useless. In fact, it is mere mockery to say, Lord, Lord, and then refuse to do the things that He commands us to do. Boy, that's true. It's like Vance Habner said, Jesus is either Lord of all or He's not Lord at all. Billy Sunday said, the backslider likes the preaching that would not hit the broad side of a barn while the real disciple is delighted when the truth brings him straight to his knees. Amen? I love preaching that convicts. You know what? What that tells me, the Holy Spirit of God in me is taking the Word of God and working it in me. And that's, that's an amazing truth but because it, it, it shows that I'm saved. It shows that God is in me and I'm in Him. One pastor, when asked if he had a deaf ministry in his church, he replied, sometimes I think the whole church is a part of the deaf ministry. He said, preach, 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 and people do their own thing. And, you know, used to, and I remember back in the days when, you know, the preacher would call you out. He'd call you down and he'd call you up. Where were you? What were you doing? And he wasn't nice about it. He wasn't, hey, how you doing? You doing? I mean, where were you? What are you doing? And back then it was a welcome thing because we knew what the Word of God was. We knew what we should do. Today it's like, take it or leave it, right? Someone said this, God doesn't reveal the deep things to casual Christians who drop in for an occasional chat. Amen. Vance Habner, again, I quote him, I love that guy. He said, taking it easy is a prelude to backsliding. Comfort precedes collapse. So there must be the receiving of the word and the response to the word if we're to avoid sliding away from God. But notice the second thing, not only the caution we must heed, but the condition we must hate. Do you ever feel like you've lost your edge, spiritually speaking? Been there. Hey, it's okay. Been there, done that. I'm, I'm not scared to admit it. There's been times that uh, it, I've gone through dry spells. Have you ever had that in your marriage? I'll tell you, that's a part of marriage. You go through times where it just doesn't seem like things are clicking or things are firing on all cylinders. It, 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 maybe there's dry spells in, in your life. I'll tell you, if it can happen to your marriage, it can happen to uh, your walk of faith with the Lord Jesus. Now, am I the only one? Y'all are being so pious. I don't know what you're talking about, Pastor. Well, maybe I'm the only center in here, but I'll tell you what, there's a condition we must hate, and here it is in verse 1. Therefore we ought to give the most earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them, what, slip. That's the condition we should hate. And yet I see it everywhere I look. 
people have lost their edge, their spiritual footing. The word slip here, it describes what happens when somebody begins to slip. Do you, do you know how that happens? It's not somebody wakes up one morning and goes, you know what, I, th- I think I'm just done. I'm just going to go walk away. It doesn't work that way. What it, what it does, and this is how the devil, it's that old adage, how do you boil a frog a little bit at a time? That's the devil's motto. How do you get somebody away from God, away from church? A little bit at a time just a little bit. And, and, and the example of the word used right here as slip, it speaks of a, a ship that would slip away from dock and drift out, drift off. And it doesn't speak of an ignorant sailor, it speaks of a careless sailor. And, and again, the word drift away right here means to begin to, it's not one of in, in, uh, ignorance, but one of indifference. The problem is not what we know, the problem is we don't do what we know. Amen? Because our minds and our hearts are filled with many good things from God's Word. We just don't do them. We dismiss them. It's a slow and gradual drifting away. Many years ago, uh, when I was young, you know, wanting to see the world and stuff like that, graduated high school with a buddy, and uh, one of the other guys that we went to school with here at Liberty Baptist Christian School, his dad was a pastor, and he moved to Silsby, Texas. And so we got old enough to be trusted to get away and drive a little bit more as we got older. Me and my buddy, we drove uh, uh, down to Silsby, Texas, uh, picked up Daryl, and then drove on to Galveston. And uh, really, my first experience with the beach is really cool. I mean, I've never been there. And uh, we're swimming in the, the Gulf of Mexico and having the time of our life. And I'm a Back then, probably not so much now, but back then I was a pretty decent swimmer and uh, wasn't really worried about, you know, being out there. I really didn't pay much attention to it. I was over my head in the water, no problem. You know, I could swim uh, and my friends could swim. But we thought everything was okay until we heard a, a horn blow. And it got our attention. And I looked and all of a sudden when we started paying attention, the shore seemed a lot further away than I remember it being all of a sudden. And there's lifeguards out there with the red flag waving it, you know, waving us in because riptides have come in. Riptides. And all of a sudden we realize we have started drifting out to sea. And that's what riptides do. They'll, they'll pull you out. I, I, I read a story this week where a kayaker had to be rescued. He got pulled out to sea in a kayak. I'm telling you what, I started trying to swim towards the shore, you know, casually, like no big deal. And all of a sudden I realized it seemed like for every one of these that I did, I lost two steps or two strokes and out further we went. And of course, back then I didn't know that you swim parallel to the shore and you'll gradually come in. And all of a sudden we started panicking and we started trying to dive under to make progress. And I mean, we were just exhausted by the time we finally got into shore and we were three miles down the beach. And I mean, we had to literally fight for our lives. What happened? We had drifted away, drifted out in riptides that we didn't even know. And when we finally realized it, it was almost too late. I'm just glad it wasn't a shark warning. I'd have walked on water if it had been a shark. (laughs) Amen? And it happens so slow you don't even notice it until it's too late. And that's the way it is with people in their walk of faith. They just start drifting a little bit at a time. A little bit here and a little bit there. And before they know it, what happened? And they honestly can't say. They begin to neglect the things of God in their life and the Word of God in their life. And there's no passion. Seems like there's no point to it. Before they know it, they've slipped, slid away. What was the problem? They begun to slip. They drifted. I've personally counseled so many people down through the years and they had once been on fire for God and then they come to me or I come to them or meet them where they're at. And just incrementally, one thing at a time, they let it go. And other things took its place. You don't think the devil is smart? You don't think the devil knows how to fill your life with good things to take place of the best thing? 
That's what He does. He doesn't fill your life necessarily with bad. I mean, He doesn't come to you with meth and go, here, get on meth and you can walk away from God. He doesn't do that. He puts, starts putting good things. You know, did you know that He can even use good, godly things like family to, to pull you away a little bit at a time? Family, we got, a, we got this family thing, and then the next week we didn't expect it, we got this sickness thing, and then I had to work thing, and before you know it, it's been a month and you've been away from God. We ought to give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time they should slip. So there's the danger of drifting away, but notice secondly, there's the danger of drying up. Where there was once fullness, I know so many people that are empty today. I'm not talking, by the way, he's not writing to lost people. He's, to, he's writing to Christians here. Notice he in, includes himself in that verse right there. Therefore, we, you see that? We ought to give more honest heed. He's talking to himself. There's the danger of drying up. So many people, one day they wake up to find that they've lost power with God. They don't know why. It reminds me of, it, it reminds me of uh, characters in the Bible. Reminds me of Saul. He set out to do something for God that God didn't tell him to do. And he didn't even realize that the Spirit of God had left him. He wists not, the Bible says, that the Spirit of God had left him. And I think that probably describes so many in churches today, including some pastors in pulpits. They're going through the motions, they're doing their job, and they have no clue that God's not even there. The Holy Spirit has walked out because they left Him. They left their first love. That word slip right there means to uh, flow like a river, and it's descriptive of a river flowing by, and it describes somebody that becomes an observer. They come and they watch and they see and the river flows by and the river flows by. And I've known people throughout the years, they've let things get them discouraged in the faith and defeat them. Something upset them. And today they're out of God's work. And I want you to understand, God does not stop and wait on us to get over our disappointment and our dislikes and our busy schedule. Like a river, His work goes on with or without me. I know pastors, they get to thinking, well, you know what, I'll tell you what, boy, that church couldn't do without me. Oh, yes, it can. Oh, yes, it can. And the truth is, God can do without you if you're not willing to follow Him. That's, that's strong right there. I realize that. But the truth is, God don't need us. We need Him. The river flows on if we sit and watch it. If we do not stay in the Word of God, doing the work of God, We'll be left standing on the bank while God's blessings flow right on by us. Dr. Patterson, one of my mentors and friends, both mine and Brother Copeland's, he, many years ago, he was talking about in the church, and of course he was mentoring us and instructing on us on how to deal with things in the church. And he likened to an old moss back member that was just against everything and mean and rude and, you know, give the pastor and any time there was a vision, just pour water on it, just give the pastor fits. He likened them to an old stump. And he said, you know what you do? He said, you don't get dynamite and blow an old stump out. He said, you just keep plowing, and you plow right on around them, and before long you'll be so far down, that old stump won't even matter as it looks in the rearview mirror. Amen? Amen. And the truth is, that's, that's us. If, if we're going to stand still and observe, God's just going to keep on going and keep moving and keep doing. I know there's been folks come through here many years ago that thought, you know what, if I leave... That place will fold up. Hey, we're still going. You know, we could do better. We need some more people. We need some, some chairs filled up, amen? amen? But I guarantee you that, that right there will not, not, not happen because we're not preaching the Word of God. We're not going to fill this place up by just giving a little unicorns and butterflies and, and rainbow messages. We're going to preach the Word. And if people will come and hear that and support that and be a part of that, then praise God, come on. Otherwise, it'll just be me and Brother Hill here and we'll have church. Amen? My friends, I want to show you the last thing this morning. A caution we must heed, a condition we must hate. But there's a course that we must hold. And can I tell you more than ever, we need to hold it today. 
A.W. Tozer said this. He said, the unintended garden, an unintended garden will soon be overrun with weeds. And the heart that fails to cultivate truth, the heart that fails to cultivate truth and root out error will shortly be a theological wilderness. There are many that once held the Bible doctrine and now today they live in error. They live in error. They failed to hold the course. They failed to stand firm in the faith. They failed to earnestly contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered. Can I tell you this? Doctrine matters. Doctrine's important. And let me say this. If things are different, they can't be the same. Amen? That's just, that's just a natural deduction by default. If, if what they say they believe is different than what we say we believe and what we believe is the Bible, then somebody's wrong. Well, we're, just, we're all going by just different roads. No, we're not. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That's doctrine, by the way. That's called the doctrine of soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. That's rich with meaning, by the way. And no man comes to the Father except through me. He's the narrow gate. Where's everybody going? The broad gate. All dogs don't go to heaven, my friends, and neither do people. It's those that accept and trust the Lord Jesus Christ and His finished work at, at Calvary. Things that are, aren't di- are, are different cannot be the same. I love the brilliant literary expression of Shakespeare. I'm not a big Shakespeare guy, but here's what he wrote. He said, There is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at its ebb, leads to victory. Neglected, the shores of time are strewn with the wreckage. What does that mean? It's the same same expression as the garden unattended is covered with weeds. Life that is not cared for and cultivated and nurtured to follow Christ is soon a spiritual wilderness. There's a constant awareness of sin, folks, that we must know. We must be aware of sin. Amen? Amen. And if we're not in the Bible, we're not aware of sin. I've heard preachers say, Olstein to be exact, he goes, well, people know they're in sin and they know what sin is. Well, no, people are calling sin no longer sin. I mean, they're doing things today that it's not sin anymore. And so preachers like me have to call it what it is, amen? Now, we don't, we don't put degrees on sin. We don't go, well, that's really a bad sin and that's not such a bad sin. Sin is sin, amen? But we've got to identify it. What is it? Well, the Word tells us. Notice verse 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. What does that speak of right there? There's two categories of sin. Transgressions and disobedience. Do you see it right there? Transgressions and disobedience. Transgressions, what is that? That's breaking God's law. That's breaking God's moral law. And we we have a pretty good idea what some of that looks like. Amen? It's a sin of commission. It's something that we take on and we do. But notice disobedience. What is that? That's inattention. Inattention. What is this? This is a failure to do what God has said. Notice that they're coupled together. They're coupled together. Transgression and disobedience. People, you know, I've heard so many people go, well, I don't drink, I don't chew, and I don't go with the girls that do. Okay, great. What are you doing for Jesus? Us Baptists, us fundamental Baptists used to talk all the time about don't do this, don't do that, and don't do this, and don't go there, and don't wear that, and do the, you know, and then we left out all the, the do's. Be faithful, be loving, be obedient, be kind-hearted, be uh, long-suffering. What about all that? There's sins of omission. And notice the writer speaks of the word spoken by angels. What is this? This is a reference to the way God sent His word in the Old Testament. When God would send His Word in the Old Testament, it would be, and we see that if you go back to uh, uh, chapter 1, it says God had been at sundry times and He spoke this way. Now He's speaking through who? Jesus Christ. We see it there in verse, uh, chapter 1 and verse 1. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. Again, the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what it's talking about. And the word, it says, was steadfast, means reliable and true, that which was given by the angels. And it goes on to say, how much more 
reliable and true is the word when it comes from the Son of Almighty God, Jesus Christ. And it says, those that dismissed and disobeyed the word of the angels, they got punished, they got disciplined by God. By the way, God disciplines every child that He loves, the Bible says. And that's what good parents do. You cannot go and live in sin and be wayward away from God and not see God bringing some chastening in your life. Now, God doesn't come down all of a sudden and just crush you. I mean, most people couldn't handle that. But God, you know, just a little tap here and there. Hey, come on. Let's get back on task. He says, you know what? If they received a proper punishment, how shall we escape punishment of sin seeing that we've personally received the word from the Lord Jesus Christ? Much more significant, he says. Angels, one thing. Yeah, that's awesome. Jesus, something totally different. If they did not escape punishment for disobeying God's commands delivered by angels, they certainly are not going to escape. You know what the verse that scares me in all the Bible? Exodus 34, 7. God will in no wise clear the guilty, but will visit the sins of the, the fathers to the sons and daughters to the third and fourth generation. It says, it begins by showing mercy to the thousands, amen? And God is merciful and he's, He gives grace, amen, for that, Right? But he won't clear the guilty. He will not wink at sin. He'll not say, well, you know what? You had a bad day. And if it was just on me, that's one thing. But my fear and my... I've begged God because I've done some stupid stuff in my life. I've begged God, please don't put that on my kids. And if you tear your coming, my grandkids, Amen. If there was any reason for us to walk by faith and, and to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, if you've got little ones following you, that's it. Showing mercy to thousands, but God will in no wise clear the guilty, but visit the sins of the fathers to the sons and daughters to the third and the fourth generation. Exodus 34, 7 scares me to death. God loves people, but folks, I'm going to tell you, God hates sin. God hates sin. So there's a constant awareness of sin we must have. But secondly, and this brings me to Brother Hill's song, a constant appreciation for salvation. Amen? What will keep you from sin? Thanking Jesus every day that you're saved. <laughs> Amen? We see it in, in verse number 3. He says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? This verse, of course, is oftentimes used to appeal to lost people. But again, he's writing to Christians. He says, we... Notice, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? By the way, it's a good, it's a good, a good uh, application to lost people, but the context is to you and I, Christians. It's an admonition to the saints. The word neglect right here means to make light of. The word great, of course, speaks of vast and mighty. And I think with me, think with me about the great grace of God. Amen? Grace... We've heard it in, uh, defined as unmerited favor. It's kind of complex, sounds like. Here's what I like to call it. Grace is God doing for me that and I, something I desperately need and I could in no way, any time, it would be impossible for me to do it for myself. That's what grace is. God doing for me that which I can never do for myself. Then there's God's mercy. What is that? That's God not doing to us what we deserve. That's God staying in His judgment. That's God when we're, we're under the blood. That's God saying, you know what? I'll not hold that sin against you. I'll cast it as far as the east is from the west. And I'll remember it no more. That's why for the child of God, when we live in willful sin, God deals, disciplines us and deals with us right now. He ain't going to deal with it in eternity. Heaven's going to be sweet. For Christians, but we'll deal with it right now. And, the, and Paul talked about it. He said, there's many a saints that are, are sick. There's many a saints that are asleep because it was just better that they be brought home to God than to continue to live in, in, as a Christian in sin and hurt the cause of Christ. You think that happens? I tell you, the Bible says it does. I've often wondered, you know, Paul had a thorn in the flesh. I've got some thorns in the flesh. And I'm not talking about numb skulls in the ministry. I'm talking about, you know, different pains and aches and things that I deal with. 
There's been times, I, God, man, that's, that is such a hindrance. It would be awesome if you would take it away. And I have to re- remember what he told Paul. My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. I thank God for my great salvation. What about you? Amen. Testimony of a man who neglected the Lord's work goes like this. I looked upon a farm one day and I, that I once used to own. The barn had fallen to the ground and fields were overgrown. The house in which my children grew, where we had lived for years, I turned to see it broken down and brushed aside the tears. I looked upon my soul one day to find that it too had grown with thorns and nettles everywhere the seeds neglect had sown. The years had passed while I had had cared for things of lesser worth. The things of heaven I let go while minding the things of earth. To Christ I turned with bitter tears and cried, O Lord, forgive I've not much time left for thee, not many years to live. The wasted years forever gone, the days I can't recall. If I could live those days again, I'd make you Lord of all. My mind goes to the story of Robert Robertson. Robert Robertson was a a man of God many, many years ago, some 200 years ago in England. and He was a man that God had used in a great way. He was born in England and... And God used him. He was uh, influenced under the ministry of George Whitfield, which was one of the great revivalists and preachers of that day. And he gave his heart to Christ in one of those meetings. And sometime later, he was called to the ministry, and he went and surrendered to preach. And by the age of 25, uh, Robert Robertson was pastoring a great Baptist church in Cambridge, England. And numbers were growing, and people were coming to Christ, and things were great, it seemed like. And yet, he suffered a lapse in faith, and would ultimately fall into sin. The years passed and and he faded from the scene and nobody really remembered Robert Robertson. One day he was making a trip on stagecoach and it happened that a lady was sitting there next to him and she was reading a book and and she was just delighted with what she was reading and she she opened the book and she, she turned to Robertson and showed the page to him that she had come upon and he looked at the first few lines of the hymn that read this, Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy ever ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. He read no further and and he tried to divert the woman's attention to the scenery outside, but she wouldn't have it. She says, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that awesome? This hymn, what do you think about it? He said, I must admit something to you, ma'am. And he burst into tears. He said, I'm Robert Robinson. I'm the one that authored that hymn. And he wrote that hymn, and and it seemed like in almost a prophetic way, he authored part of the hymn, and it said this, Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Wonder is exactly what Robert Robinson did. And he died at the age of 55, having not finished his course serving the God he loved. Now, folks, I, I, I see this so many times, and it breaks my heart. I see the danger in my own life. I see the draw and the pull to drift. It seems like the pull of the world and the devil and even my own flesh is greater and greater, it seems like. You would think as you get older and more settled and more grounded that it, that it would be less and less, and yet I see the pull of the world and the devil in these end times drawing people away, falling away people are. They're being drawn, and it breaks my heart. If I see it in my own life, it makes me wonder the state of hearts listening today here and online. You know what the good news is? If you've drifted, God's never moved. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's kind of like the story of the two elderly folks in the pickup truck back when they had the one bench seat and she's on her side of the truck and he's on his side of the truck and they they pass a truck and there's a a young couple there and they're sitting side by side, almost look like one person they're so close. And she said, we used to do that. What happened? He said, Ma... I'm in the same place I've always been. You're the one that moved. Isn't that so true? With God, He's never moved. And yet we find ourselves so many times 
not as close to God as we once were. And what Bob Jones Sr. said rings true. We've slipped, slid away. We've backslidden. People don't like to be called backsliders, amen? I'm one of them. But can I tell you something? I've been a backslider before. Because there's been times that I were I was closer to God and in the moment of realization. You know what I prayed before I came out here? God, convict me with this message. God, use this message to change me. Use this message to draw me closer to you. Amen. Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, thank you for your word. And I thank you for these dear folks. I love them. And I pray, Father, this morning that the message is helpful. Yes, a challenge. Perhaps a confrontation of a situation. A life that just needs passion and purpose restored. That's between you and them, Father. But my prayer this morning is is that no one would leave this room or leave the YouTube channel or our Facebook Live or our website having listened to this message and they continue to be a part, estranged from Almighty God today. That every one of us, whether in our seats or on our knees, would heed the word of God when you said, draw nigh unto me and I will draw nigh unto you. It's the story of the prodigal father and son. He turned on his way back home and the father ran to him. What a beautiful picture that is for each of us. When we've wandered, when we've drifted, when we've strayed, to know that the promise of the Father is, come home, come back. I'm waiting, I'm looking, and I'm longing. And the minute you turn to me, I'm going to run to you. God, have your will in your way in this invitation. If there's somebody out in the sound of my voice, again, in this room or online that's never given their life to Christ, I pray today would be the day of salvation. And for those of us of faith, Lord, that you just, again, draw us to you and let us leave here with passion and purpose. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, Brother Hill begins to sing. Some have already come. You need to come. You come on. Don't wait. We don't want to continue an invitation if people are just going to sit or God's not moving. But if God's moving in your heart, come on. You need somebody to pray with you? Come on. You need to sit there on the seat, then you do that. You do what you need to do to deal with what God has dealt with you about. And to Him be glory. When the music fades, the Lord is stripped away, and I simply come. Longing just to And all God's people said, well, amen. Go ahead and remain standing if you would. I got you conditioned. You're ready to set. Just remain standing because, uh, again, we don't have a a bulletin. Our copiers are still down. But uh, remember this, uh, Wednesday night 
at 7 o'clock. We've got all the classes going. And uh, if you uh, don't work during the year, but you're willing to maybe help uh, on a rotation with the Wednesday night uh, while Randy and Mary are in New York. I talked to Randy this week. They're doing great. It's been a little crazy around them up there, as you can well imagine, with Rochester and Buffalo not being too far from them. But they're doing great. Uh, and uh, But we, we need some somebody that can maybe help with the kids uh, either every week or every couple of weeks or whatever works best for you. But anyway, if you can do that, that'd be a big blessing. Come see me or see Brother Hill, and we'll get, get you hooked up. And uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, we teach the Word of God. We don't want to, you know, keep them for two hours doing that. We have that, King's Kids, during the, during the year, and we stay longer with that. But basically, it's just a time of, uh, uh, of a devotion, uh, playtime, snacks, if you want to do something like that. Uh, just uh, we want the kids to have a good time. It's summer. We'll have water nights. We'll do some other things throughout the summer, but this is is something that we could really use some help, and that'd be a big blessing to me as your pastor if you're interested in doing that. You don't have to be, uh, you know, a seminary-trained teacher to do it. It's it's something that that I can provide you with the information and the materials you need if if you need something like that, but it'd be a big blessing if you could help out with that. 7 o'clock, and then remember, Sunday school. 9.15, 9.15, if you want to do coffee and donuts and stuff like that, get here at 9.15. I think uh, everybody tries to start no later than 9.30. That way they're not uh, keeping you right into the service time. But uh, remember that. Try to start, be here on time if at all possible. Invite your friends. Let's, let's get our, our church family back on task. Amen? Sunday school is a time, and we've got, we're blessed to have very gifted teachers uh, here in our church, and they do a tremendous job. And so... Uh, to, to hear from other men and women of God uh, here in the church, uh, you know, whether it's children's ministry, youth ministry, or adults, Brother Copeland's class on Sunday mornings, it's a big blessing to you. Vast amount of knowledge of the Bible, and I love hearing him teach and preach. In fact, I'm going to have him preach here before long, so uh, uh, I might not leave to go on vacation, but I'm still going to have him preach because he does a tremendous job. And he's a blessing to me, one of my favorite preachers. So anyway, take advantage of that. And we'll start some activities back up as uh, things continue to open up in a way that uh, it's not crazy out there. I noticed that the, uh, the family fun zone, the Plex, is open again. So we're probably going to do our family fun night on a Sunday night where everybody comes out, has pizza, and the kids can run wild and ride the rides and play the games and stuff like that. But we're also going to start our refreshes back uh, come uh, the end of this month and in, on into July and August, okay? And Lord willing, uh, all this virus stuff will go away and we can continue just to stay on task throughout the year. So be praying uh, for these folks. Continue to pray for Randy and Mary that are traveling. Continue to pray for our shut-ins and elderly uh, that are still uh, uh, locked in and no doubt uh, fearful of this coronavirus. But here's a special one. Uh, Kevin and Kimberly Robertson, you know who they are. Uh, dear friends of ours and members of our church, he served as deacon. Kimberly's dad, Bill Funderburg is his name, with an F, Funderburg, um, got Alzheimer's, served in ministry for 35 years, got an Alzheimer's, and uh, just the last couple of years, it's progressed pretty quick. Well, uh, his son come off the mission field, they moved him to Louisiana, and Kevin and Kimberly and the family through all the coronavirus, nobody's been able to see him. Well, the family got the call last week that he was starting to pass, and that the family could come. Well, his wife, Joyce, who's in really good health and everything, she went in to see him, but what they didn't tell her was they, he started running a fever that day. So by law, in the nursing home, they have to check for COVID. He had COVID-19. None of the family seen him, so he got it from one of the nurses because he's bedridden. He's not in contact with any of the patients. So one of the nurses brought it to him. So anyway, the thing is this. Bill's going to be with the Lord Jesus here real soon, and he's ready to go, Okay. But now Joyce has been exposed to coronavirus. Kevin and Kimberly and the girls, Kimberly's brother and all their family have been exposed to Joyce. So please pray for them that uh, that will come back negative with Joyce so that they don't all have to be in lockdown for 14 days, 30 days, however long it is. They all have jobs and ministries and all those kinds of things. So please be in prayer for those dear friends of ours. And when Bill passes, they're actually going to be coming back to Wichita Falls and to Liberty and uh, we're going to just have a, a, a little memorial thing for Bill because uh, a lot of his uh, uh, family wanted to come, and this is, this is home for Kevin and Kimberly. Even though they're in Temple, Texas, uh, they, they love liberty. In fact, they still send tithes and offerings here. So 
pray for them. Uh, they're, they're really going through a rough time, especially Kimberly right now. So, Anything else I need to mention? I want to say a big thanks to Brother Hill, Brother Duke, and Brother Rick Motley for helping with the yard work this week. Didn't it look good out there? Y'all give them a big hand for their faithful work. And also, my pop, Jack Ross, is 75 this week. Give him a big hand for a happy birthday. So, uh, anyway, he's in better health than I am. Yes. Sure. Well, amen. We'll give the Lord a hand. Amen. Well, all right. Well, and it's good to have some folks visiting with us today. Liberty family, just make them feel another warm welcome. And I'm going to ask Brother Duke. Uh, I ran into him last week. I thought I put him in the hospital with the ride mower, and uh, I didn't. But he's here today, so I'm going to ask him to dismiss in prayer. And uh, I love you guys. Thank you so much for your service to the Lord and your love for Liberty Baptist Church. Let's, let's lift one another up and, 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 and stay, stay on our knees through all of this craziness that's going on. I know God's got a plan and a purpose. And I know He's in control, okay? But let's do our part. Let's bombard heaven. The Bible still says, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, He said, I'll hear from heaven and I'll heal their land. It's not on all the rioters. It's on God's people. Get on our knees and pray, and God will hear, and God will heal. Amen? Brother Duke.